Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope you've been having a great Unite experience so far. We're happy to kick off today's Solutions Track session. My name is Asaf Francis and I'm Zen City's Director of Urban Policy and Partnerships. Before my role at Zen City, I was a Senior Project Manager on the Tel Aviv IT by Bloomberg Philanthropies. I also have with me today, Ryan Felipe, not the actor, but I do have Ryan Kurtzman uh, from the city of Long Beach and Felipe Romero from the city of Brownsville, Texas. Um, a little bit about Ryan. So Ryan is a Smart Cities Program Manager for the city of Long Beach. Long Beach. Ryan ex Ryan's experience includes developing community programs and policies that leverage technology to improve connectivity, mobility, digital equity, and economic outcomes for all residents. He also leads the city's open data and data governance programs. Before that, Ryan served as a, as a policy fellow for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, where he brokered partnerships and created programs, evaluation tools to advance the city's great streets initiatives and park equity goals. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have with us uh, Felipe Romero, Director of Communication and Marketing for the city of Brownsville, Texas. In his role, Mr. Felipe Romero has infused his ideas of creative growth and innovation through all forms of communication with this, within the city of Brownsville. With a background in communication studies and a passion for Brownsville, Felipe is determined to enhance this community uh, through growth and progress. So, so for those of you who don't know Zen City yet, uh, we're a platform solution helping over 160 local governments of all sizes better understand their residents, especially those who don't directly engage with you through official channels of engagement. Um, we enable local governments and, and their leaders to tap into residents' organic feedback, needs and concerns around key local government issues. These include public safety, sanitation, parks and recreation, transportation, and more recently, also around masks, reopening, and everything COVID-19 related. We do that by way of our technology, which automatically extracts and, anon and anonymizes millions of data points from organic resident engagement channels, which includes social media, news media, and city hotlines, both city-owned channels and non-city-owned channels, and then analyzes them according to different parameters, which I'll show in a second. So um, when we're looking at tracking conversations around your reopening efforts, we create what we call a project on your dashboard. In it, you can slice and dice all the discourse about reopening according to different parameters of sentiment, location, volume, topics, channels on which it is being discussed, and over time. As you can see in the dashboard here, and I'm going to point to a few of those, this is the score over time for that type of discourse, the overall sentiment, and all the features up here on top, which you can play around with. And as I mentioned, slice and dice the data, export it, send it to your colleagues, etc. We also create insights based on this data, which are crafted by our team of analysts, and I will share several in a couple of minutes. So to set the stage for the discussion, we checked to see what aggregated data around reopening from across our network uh, is telling us. So first of all, uh, when we looked at the data, sort of the data trend from May to August, what we were able to see is that in May, conversations really peaked and were mostly about questions if, when, how, and when uh, reopening will happen. As implementation began to take place, moving into the months of the year, uh, and in some cases, rolling back is taking place, right, in California, for example, conversations specifically about reopening begin to dwindle. Um, if we're looking back at May, which was the month where we had the most discourse around reopening, actually about 20% of, uh, of the entire discourse around reopening, oh, sorry, around coronavirus, was specifically uh, discussing reopening. If we're looking more in detail into that, we can see that by sectors, entertainment venues were the, was the sector that was discussed the most, followed by restaurants, retail, and parks and beaches. Uh, recurring things around this were, first of all, that residents seem to be understanding that there's no one size fits all, right? You can't open the cinemas the same way you're gonna open the beach, uh, and gov governments need to adapt and create new regulations for each of those. Uh, capacity of businesses and venues seem to be a key element in discussions, right? How is that going to be regulated? Who is going to enforce it? Um, an interesting point was also around joint responsibility. So from a lot of the discussions around reopening, we saw that there seems to be an understanding that the responsibility is shared between the city, business operators, and residents. And non-compliance was obviously a big concern, and it still is, right? Around masks, uh, maintaining social distance, etc. 
Uh, going back to the discourse sort of over time from May to August, we see that across three topics that we chose to display here, right? So festivals and public events, parks and uh, park amenities, and restaurants and bars, we see that the sort of the discourse is kind of moving around along the same trend uh, in terms of the curve and where they peak. And as more sectors open up, the discourse sort of levels and balances out. One evident takeaway from this graph is that restaurants and bars dominate the discourse, mostly due to many support programs and initiatives, some of which we'll hear about today, uh, as well as changing regulations. Uh, and a lot of the discourse also specifically around bars versus restaurants. In many places we had scenarios where bars weren't allowed to open, restaurants were allowed to open, and some bars have sort of adapted their services in order to be able to open and continue uh, to operate under the new regulations. So let's dive a bit deeper into some examples of reopening discourse through a few insights. Oops, sorry. So um, in this insight over here uh, from a city in California, we see how residents' complaints about health regulations compliance differ by sector and how the trend line of those changes over time. You can see that on the right. Uh, this really allowed the city in this case to understand where the friction points about specific regulations such as masks and social distancing exist and where more enforcement and perhaps more communication is needed. Um, in another case from a city in Texas, actually, a reopening of a water park facility generated a lot of discourse during the, the month of August. Our analysis in this case, first of all, identified that most of the discourse actually occurred on online news channels a source that the city isn't really monitoring regularly or directly. Secondly, as you can see here, we divided up the discourse into interactions for and against keeping the, the water park open. Those for keeping the venue open claimed that health regulations were actually being observed and that it's people's personal choice to go or not to go, which is an argument that I'm sure all of us are, are hearing, whether online or offline, uh, around reopening of all different sectors. In this case, the city was able to incorporate this feedback uh, in the decision about keeping the park open or not. In the last example that I want to show here, uh, this is from the 4th of July actually, and we can see the sentiment distribution around the announcement of canceling the fireworks show. Uh, in this case, the city was able to learn about the drivers of the negative sentiment, right? So why were, neg were uh, residents negative about these motions, uh, which included First and foremost, protests versus celebrations. Why are protests allowed to continue to happen when celebrations aren't allowed? The loss of freedom, particularly around Independence Day, obviously, and claims that residents will organize their own shows or drive out to neighboring South Carolina cities to view fireworks shows uh, there. And so with plenty of events that you as a city are leading, you constantly need to be adaptive, right, to new regulations that prioritize your residents' health and safety. It's therefore important in this case to understand what your residents' expectations are and how you, your different initiatives and events uh, that you are holding, be, be it physical or virtual, are being perceived, uh, perceived by your residents. And so before I hand it off uh, to our additional speakers, if you're curious to learn more about how Zen City can help you with your recovery efforts, feel free to reach out to me directly, visit our booth, or contact us through our website, zencity.io. And uh, with that, I'm going to let Ryan and Felipe tell us about their work and experience around issues of reopening and recovery. And um, Ryan, we're gonna kick it off with you. Great, uh, thanks Asaf for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Ryan Kurtzman. I work for the city of Long Beach, California as our Smart Cities Program Manager. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about how we are using data and resident feedback to guide our reopening strategy here in Long Beach. Next slide, please. So I first want to just give a quick overview of the city of Long Beach for those that might not be familiar with us. Um, we are located in LA County, um, kind of right between the city of Los Angeles and Orange County. And we have about 500,000 residents here in our city. Um, we're also a very diverse community. We have about 40% uh, Latino population, 30% uh, white and about 15% uh, Asian and black population as well. And like many cities, um, kind of in the wake of coronavirus, we're really facing a lot of strained budgets and projected shortfalls. Um, three of our major revenue sources have all been really impacted by COVID-19. Um, first, we have the Port of Long Beach, uh, which is the second biggest port in the country. Um, obviously, we've seen less activity there. Um, second, we get a lot of our revenue from oil activity in our city, and we've seen huge declines in that source. And then tourism has been impacted as well. Um, one of the biggest events that we have in our city is the Long Beach Grand Prix, 
um, which is a, a race uh, in our downtown area, uh, which is projected to bring around $30 million to our city every year. That was canceled, obviously. Um, so we are still sort of dealing with some of the, the side effects of that on our city budget. But one thing that does make Long Beach unique is that we're one of three jurisdictions in California that has its own city health department. Um, so with that, we've been able to have access to health data and hospital data um, and community level data that has really guided our response to COVID-19 uh, and helped us to uh, mitigate some of the negative effects on our community. Next slide. So like many cities in California and the United States, um, the COVID crisis has been really hard on Long Beach. We're facing record unemployment rates. We had, I think we peaked at about 21% back in April. Um, one in five tenants in LA County has paid rent late or skipped rent during the pandemic, which speaks to the uh, burden of the pandemic on people's income. And then we've experienced over 10,000 coronavirus cases, over 200 deaths. I think we're about 220 as of now. Um, including our mayor's own mother and stepfather, which is really tragic. Um, but the mayor has really been kind of our, our beacon throughout this. And from day one, he's been telling us that we need to really guide our reopening strategy through data. Um, so we've really taken that to heart in our approach so far. And on top of that, not only are we facing COVID-19, but we're also facing really a, a community push and a national push for, to advance racial equity. Uh, following the murder of George Floyd back in June. Um, so both of, facing both of those crises at once has been a challenge, um, but there's actually a lot of connections between COVID-19 and equity, um, which is kind of illustrated in the graph here on the right. Um, basically, this graph shows that in our, the darker shaded regions on the left are where we have the highest percentage of non-white residents in our city. Um, and then there's the larger circles on the graph also show where we have the highest case densities of COVID-19. And not surprisingly, those two things are very correlated. We're seeing the biggest number of cases in our communities of color, our communities that are rent burdened, and our communities that face overcrowding. Um, so the equity and COVID connection is very apparent here in Long Beach and something that we're actively trying to fight against. In fact, our black population here represents um, about only 12% of the total population, but is overrepresented in COVID deaths. We have around 19% of deaths that are among our black population. So in Long Beach, we're really using data and equity um, to guide our approach and specifically guide our distribution of federal CARES Act funding at the community level. Next slide. So the biggest challenge that I wanna to touch on today at the city of Long Beach related to COVID-19 reopening is really the balance and tension between um, policy and public health and safety. I'm sure many of you have heard, but um, in California, we reopened in a phased approach initially back in May and June. Um, and that, like many other states in the country, has caused a huge spike in cases. So one of the lessons that we've learned is that if we are going to reopen, it does need to be ideally motivated by data and not by politics and what we're hearing that's happening in other states. Um, I wanted to show these two graphs side by side because I thought they illustrated a really interesting comparison between activity and discourse around reopening and actual cases. So the top graph here is actually from Zen City. This is from our coronavirus reopening project. So it's basically discourse from our community all around the topic of reopening. And then on the bottom here is our um, epidemiology chart, which basically shows our cases, hospitalizations, and deaths over time from coronavirus. So if you kind of compare them side by side, you see a few interesting comparisons. So um, if you look at the top graph in March, um, we sort of saw a peak in our reopening discourse during the initial round of closures, as people were really starting to close things down, there was still some conversation about when are things going to reopen again? There was so much uncertainty about coronavirus. And then in late April and June, uh, if you look at the top graph, we see discourse peaking during that phased reopening period in California, where we had first our parks and beaches open, then outdoor dining, and then retail, places of worship, salons. Um, and then finally in late June is when the governor announced that bars could actually reopen. And then, not surprisingly, we see a rise in cases correlating to those reopenings, uh, which peaked around mid-July. And then if you go up to the top graph again, we see a huge spike in the reopening discourse in mid-July. And that's when our California governor, Newsom, basically issued a uh, closure of all of those things and uh, decided that we needed to be slower on our reopening approach. And then since then, in August, um, there really hasn't been much discourse about reopening, I think. Hopefully we are, I have learned from our uh, hasty reopening at first and 
uh, we will be reopening again when it's safe to do so, when the data tells us uh, that it's uh, going to be safe. Next slide, please. So in terms of our successes, um, at the cornerstone of our approach in Long Beach has really been two principles, uh, resiliency and equity. Um, I mentioned earlier that the COVID has been kind of crossing paths with the national push for racial equity. Um, so we're really trying to infuse an equity lens into all of our COVID-19 response work. And then we take resiliency very seriously here. Um, you know, we wanna build a, a community that's resilient to COVID-19 and that whenever we do bounce back from this, um, we're really, you know, targeting certain communities with approaches that make sense and leave them better off than they were when they started. So I want to touch on a couple key reopening successes that we've had here. In terms of open spaces and parks, um, our parks department has developed a community ambassador program, which is actually staffed from uh, high school and college age youth. Um, and what they do is they go around to our parks and open spaces and promote safe behavior and social distancing and mask wearing in an educational and compassionate way, rather than um, you know, having our police or fire department go out and issue formal citations. Um, in terms of retail, we've activated a venue task force, um, which is based out of our code enforcement bureau. And they do proactive and educational safety inspections of restaurants, bars, um, and other retail businesses to make sure they're operating safely. And then we've also developed an open streets program um, with two goals. First, to improve access to open space and also to enhance our business's ability to have sidewalk dining. And I wanna to touch on one key Zen City insight which we received that help us guide our approach to this. Um, so like you know, other Zen City clients, we receive insights on a regular basis. And one that we received pretty recently was that when um, our community was talking about reopening and the idea of transforming public spaces, there was way, way, way more discourse on the idea of um, you know, business operations in our economy than there was on the more um, transformative elements of public space, like the ability to enhance recreation and mental health and things like that. So with that insight in hand, that really helped guide our city's um, approach and messaging towards our parklet program and our public space programs. And we really message it more to the public, uh, not really around access to open space, but really about helping our businesses reopen and as a solution to some of the restrictions that have been placed on indoor operations. And doing this really helped us win widespread support for this program. Um, since we have issued our parklet program and our street closure program, we've closed down one major retail corridor in our downtown Long Beach that's close to cars. It's I think three blocks, that's pedestrian only. And we've issued almost a hundred sidewalk dining permits as well. Um, and those are allowing us to keep our local businesses afloat and it's giving them a chance to kind of keep restaurants operations and sales going and dine safely outdoors. So we're really proud of that effort and we were really able to capitalize on some of the resident feedback and data that we heard and gathered through the Zen City platform. Next slide. So kind of in closing, resident feedback has been a, a really key part of our recovery strategy from the beginning. Um, our Emergency Operations Center has a data team that we activated at the very start of the pandemic. And from the beginning, we've really embedded our Zen City data from our coronavirus project into our internal reporting, which goes to our key decision makers like our health director and our city manager. And we're actually currently working with Zen City to develop APIs so we can actually access that Zen City dashboard in an automated way. Um, and it's directly loaded into our dashboards, which we produce on Power BI. Um, so again, from the start, Zen City and our social media and resident feedback has been a key part of our internal decision making. And then kind of like the previous example I shared with the parklets, we're continuing to use insights and key trends to influence our messaging. Um, another example is here on this slide. Uh, we have a, another insight from Zen City on the right, which shows that our residents were sort of doubting the effectiveness of masks and our messaging around sort of the health benefits and the redu reduction of disease transmission or virus transmission with masks wasn't really resonating. So instead we took that insight and we switched our communications tactic from more traditional health and safety guidelines to a more, I guess, like human centered marketing campaign, which you can see on the left there. Um, and we've sort of created a hashtag for it, slow the spread LB. And the idea is that we wanna kind of humanize and normalize mask wearing um, and really talk about how it's everyone's duty, kind of like wearing a seatbelt or voting um, to wear a mask and protect the well-being of everyone here in our city. And we're finding that this is 
been pretty successful so far in some of our initial testing that we've done on the effectiveness of it. So in closing, Long Beach has been hit really hard by COVID-19, um, especially our communities of color, as I mentioned earlier. But um, you know, we're trying to build on this movement for racial equity and these calls for resiliency and providing really targeted solutions to our communities most in need, um, always thinking about how we can use data and resident feedback to guide our decisions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, super interesting. And uh, Felipe, on to you. Great information, Ryan. Wow, really, really interesting uh, um, uh, how you use communications and data up, uh, up in Long Beach. And Asaf, thank you for, for the invitation uh, uh, for this conference. Um, let's, go, let's go ahead and, and uh, start right away. So, um, City of Brownsville, we're, you know, we're a population of over 200 residents. We're located uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, which is at the southernmost tip of Texas, uh, bordering Mexico. And uh, we're mostly a Spanish speaking population. Um, during, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pre COVID times, uh, we actually have an interesting, uh, you know, stat for you 3.5 million, we received 3.5 million uh, Mexican nationals in the Rio Grande Valley, 38% which uh, um, are enter uh, Brownsville, Texas. So, you know, we have a huge um, Spanish influence down here on the, on, on the border. Um, some of the obstacles, as we go into the next slide, please, that we kind of encounter uh, being located on the border is, you know, not only thinking about this, but also on the equitable uh, messaging on an equitable lens, um, as, as Ryan mentioned, of not only using our English uh, communications, but also focusing on the, our Spanish lens to really connect um, with our audience and our stakeholders. So, um, we use, uh, you know, the data that we receive through Zen City to really um, make decisions on what's the best communicate, uh, what's the best way to communicate through our to our population. Uh, one of the things that we use, you know, uh, through uh, through Zen City, is you know looking at this data, those pressure points. What is it, you know, what, what is it, what is the um, what we call what, what are the, the stakeholders or the citizens that the population really pays attention to? And we found out that um, one of our trusted voices was um, our, our city mayor, Mayor uh, Trey Mendez. And um, specifically with the messages on the curfew um, early on in the pandemic, um, it was able to, we were able to really strategically shape the way we message to, to our community and also establishing um, a threat matrix to inform the community on where we're at um, during our, our COVID pandemic. The next slide, please. Some of the challenges in terms of reopening and, and, and um, going into recovery was um, the promotion of masks and the health guidelines. And, and again, one of the things that, that we deal with uh, being on the border is the Spanish communications. We also receive messaging. Um, you know, our stakeholders, our, our community really listens to the messaging um, uh, in Spanish. And they also, you know, uh, they have connections uh, or they, they, they receive uh, communications through media on the border from our Mexican uh, counterparts. So one of the things that we need to connect with, what we need to establish and, and we learned early on in the pandemic is to make sure that our messages are also aligned with the message that the, the messaging that they're receiving through our media outlets in, in Spanish. Uh, of course, we were one of the hardest hit, uh, hit uh, cities in the Rio Grande Valley, um, but we were also one of the ones that were very proactive. Uh, we have a very innovative city commission. Um, and we have a proactive mayor. Um, so we were the, one of the first cities in the Rio Grande Valley and, and in Texas rather, to establish a, a COVID-19 drive-through um, for our community, which accepted um, uh, the community members to come take COVID-19 tests, regardless if you had insurance or not. 
and that was on uh, the city of Brownsville's dime. Um, we also have multi-generational homes. So one of the interesting facts is that we have a very close sense of community in terms of, you know, we have the, the aunt or uncle or the tío and, and tía, as we call here in, in the valley of, of, of uh, multi, multi-generational homes where we have homes where we, we have a lot of family members living together. So it was really kind of, uh, we really had to look at the data that, uh, that Zen City provided in terms of uh, the pressure points and seeing how do we connect with the community, but also making sure that, you know, uh, the, the, our young demographic also is able to message to our older demographic. And of course, we also deal with not only a pandemic, but a natural disaster, uh, Hurricane Hannah um, passed through, through Brownsville, Texas, which not only gave us a hurricane, but also a, a small tornado um, during our COVID peak. Um, the glass half full um, approach here was that the, the hurricane, uh, the na this natural disaster, was actually able to help, you know, uh, uh, help our community stay at home and uh, also receive the messaging in terms of, of what we needed to do to be proactive here in Brownsville, Texas. One of the things that, that's a, a major talking point uh, down here in the Rio Grande Valley is our connectivity issues. Uh, with broadband, we have a strong digital divide, um, and we needed to look. We need to look at all resources and communications to make sure that we're building a connection with our community. So, uh, one of the challenges that that we have is, as I said, is, is broadband. And um, with Zen City, we're able to look at things um, in terms of making sure that our message, our messages, are going through the proper platforms and seeing. Where, where our audience gets their information. Next slide, please. We also have uh, what we established through, during our recovery efforts, um, supported by Zen City da Data, is um, you know one the BTX Cares um, kind of platform. We created a platform to establish messaging for COVID nineteen through our community called you know BTX Cares Brownsville Cares. Um, and it's, it was a very impactful and strategic messaging platform that we, we implemented and we've been using down here in Brownsville to make sure that the community knows uh, where to get their information. Um, we established grant programs for businesses. Um, we've, we've done COVID-19 disinfectant, disinfection trainings. Um, we promote testing, drive-through testing strongly uh, through our curbside or drive-through operations. And you know, one of the key talking points that we are now establishing as we are looking to reopen and reopening our, our city um, is the, the economic outreach to our hotels you know, um, through, through established hotel roundtables um, and also our economic development and, and making sure that we talk um, uh, what we're doing or, or telling the story of Brownsville on how we're doing in terms of our, our reopening and our resiliency to, to really reinvent uh, and innovate what we're doing post uh, COVID. Next slide, please. The recovery and the, res the resident feedback um, is really the driver that we use as the same as Ryan discussed in, 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 in his presentation in Long Beach is, is really looking at the data that's provided to us to really um, you know, guide our process and really see how we're going to recover. And, and it's, it's through informed feedback through this data that we take an approach in terms of establishing our guidelines um, for our community. Um, one of the unique things also, as I, you know, as I discussed with you all in terms of our digital divide, is looking at other areas uh, uh, in terms of being innovative and in how we communicate to to our stakeholders so we you know we we now uh, acquired software through CityBot, which is really cool because they're now talking to zen city so we city bot is actually a platform that uh sends two-way communication through text messaging um that's just another way of getting our COVID messages out to our stakeholders and now uh, zen city is able to extract that data to get more measurements 
uh, and tracking metrics that we need to make sure that our messaging is going out and it's being effective in terms of, of letting, letting the community know how we're gonna recover from this. Next slide. And then one of the things that also the driving points on, on what Zen City, you know, really helps us out with this is in terms of our outreach and, and making sure we have, um, you know, a proper gauge on how we're doing with the community. Um, we, we look at the data that we receive through Zen City to really push our food distribution drives, uh, really promote this, you know, our, 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 up our census, right, that's going to, you know, really be the gauge for the next 10 years. Um, you know, through our, our hurricane, um, really kind of get our messages out with handbag distribution and then also celebrate, you know, our, our virtual celebrations. So we, you know, we had the July, uh, rock the fourth event on uh, able to kind of see the community sentiment on what we're doing since we closed, but also taking out opportunities of, of virtual celebrations. Next slide, please. The, lastly, you know, I'd like to give some closing remarks in terms of what we're doing um, and, and kind of adding to what Ryan and Asaf mentioned is, you know, uh, as a city uh, on a national level, we have to look at different resources and ways to really engage our audience and communicate with them. And I think uh, looking at different softwares and opportunities to really track data and let that data drive a de the decision making is really important and uh, you know I commend uh, Zen City and the team here in terms of sharing their information to make sure that we're providing the information needed for our community our stakeholders uh, to really uh, take an advanced approach to getting ahead of this and recover uh, faster than we thought of. Thank you. Thank you very much Felipe. Uh, great to see all the great examples and uses that you get for our platform and how both of you mentioned, you know, leading the conversation around reopening with data. Um, Ryan, anything you want to add about, um, to kind of finish us off, anything regarding how you think reopening would look like at the end of September in Long Beach? Any uh, predictions? Yeah, I want to agree with Felipe and kind of reinforce the idea that data does need to guide us. Um, I think in California and Long Beach, we've seen what happens when we lose sight of that. Um, and I remain cautiously optimistic that we will learn from kind of that, that mistake and that lesson and, and really move forward using data to guide us in our decision making. And I sort of see that as my role in our, in our organization uh, as our smart cities manager and also um, the leader of our COVID-19 data team to sort of be that advocate for the data and to make sure that doesn't get lost as part of the bigger narrative around uh, COVID-19 reopening. But I think um, in a month, it, it's hard to say. I don't think much will be different, at least I hope not. Um, you know, in, in California, at least, Governor Newsom released uh, last Friday on August 28th um, some new state guidelines for reopening. Um, so I think um, people will be monitoring those and trying to understand how those will impact what we can do here in Long Beach. Um, and I think, you know, our community is, they want to reopen. Like, I think the, it's hard to ignore that the effects of COVID-19 have been very real and very hard for a lot of families and a lot of uh, individuals and communities here in our city. Um, you know, are the economies impacted? People are out of a job. I think people are just kind of clamoring for something um, and for a reopening. But I think, I think striking that balance is going to be really important and in reopening in a very measured way uh, where we're taking proactive approaches towards ensuring health and safety, um, but also keeping an eye on the data and being Acknowledging that, you know, if if cases do spike or if we see some activity that's not great, um, that we are okay with going back and rolling things back to make sure that we're protecting as many people as we can here in our city. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we're going to move on to the live Q&A. Thanks again, Ryan and Felipe. Welcome to this uh, Q&A session. I'm Rick Aaronholt, your moderator, and I'm here with Ryan and Asaf. And um, if you have questions for them, please enter them into the chat and I will read them out. And if you want to come and ask your question verbally, just type the word question into the chat and I will unmute you and allow you to speak. 
So I will kick it over to you all for some opening comments while we wait for questions. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. And uh, hey, Ryan. Um, I will say Felipe couldn't join us due to an emergency meeting that he had. But first of all, I want to start off by saying thank you both for joining us uh, for the recording and to you, Ryan, for joining us uh, for the Q&A session. Um, we'd love to take some questions from those who join us through the chat. Uh, but I will kick off with uh, asking Ryan to tell us about a bit about the recovery and reopening efforts um, for the city of Long Beach since we've uh, this, since we've talked about this last. Uh, how, has, how have residents been reacting to what you guys have been doing uh, and what kind of activities, initiatives the city is promoting? Sure, yeah, so since we left off last time, I think the biggest development was that the California governor, Gavin Newsom, published um, additional guidelines for cities and counties for how to reopen, um, all sort of based on data and really looking at two major indicators at the county level, the uh, case rate, which is the number of new cases every day, and then also the positivity rate, which is um, how many of those cases that are being tested, how many of the tests are coming back positive. So the city of Long Beach is monitoring both of those indicators on a daily basis on our public facing COVID dashboard. Um, and we're also presenting the numbers of LA County as well, because those are really what guide our reopening here in the city. Um, and we've actually found that our residents are are very interested in this news. They're excited about it. Um, not surprisingly, they are eager to reopen. Um, so we're kind of continuing to monitor those. And actually on Tuesday of this week, we were just announced that we sort of moved into um, another, the second tier of reopening, the, the LA County that is. So that means that in two weeks, if we're able to hold those numbers, we can then start opening things back up again at a, a more limited capacity, which is exciting. Oh, nice. Um, you mentioned in your um, in your notes now uh, a climb, uh, sorry a, a resident facing dashboard data dashboard. Um, can you tell us a bit more about it? What kind of data are you guys sharing uh, with your residents? Have you seen any peak in interest since the start of COVID? Uh, did you have anything before COVID? That's super interesting to hear. Yeah, so we, like many other cities, developed a public facing dashboard to show the numbers in Long Beach because we feel like it's really important to make sure that our residents are informed about what's going on. Um, and we've tried to strike a balance in our dashboard between providing enough information where we're not withholding anything, but also trying to present everything in a pretty clear and succinct way. So we definitely took some cues from dashboards that got set up very early on within COVID, like the Johns Hopkins dashboard. Um, so we're showing some basic information about cases, hospitalizations, deaths, um, geographically, how those are playing out within our city. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, we found that the highest concentrations of COVID cases are in some of our more underserved communities traditionally, being West and Central and North Long Beach. Um, and this information is also used a lot by internal city staff as well. So we're using this to help make sure that we're guiding resources um, into those places that need the most and are having the highest rates of COVID and we're putting things like testing centers there and other um, facilities to make sure that those folks are able to really have all the tools they need to get tested and uh, isolate and quarantine if they need to. But the dashboards evolved over time. I mean, the state guidance and national guidance has been kind of wavered from non-existent to very burdensome. So we've been trying to make sure that we're, you know, reflecting what's asked of us and for reporting purposes at both the state and the national level. And in terms of the resident interest in it, I think, yeah, we get a lot of, of feedback that we learned through Zen City, that we learned by monitoring social media about the public's use of the dashboard. And it's, 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 you know, it's unfortunately quite political, like many things are right now. I think my own monitoring of, of social media sentiment about our dashboard and in the COVID data, I think, there's many people who think that the data is inaccurate or are poking holes in it. Um, and there's others that are urging us to look at the data and use it to inform our mask wearing or individual behaviors. So um, we're not seeing anything too surprising on the reaction to it, but um, there's also a lot of people that we know that aren't necessarily uh, making their opinions heard about it, but are still using it as part of their daily understanding and communications about COVID. Um. I'm just looking to see if there's any uh, any questions. If not, we, I can ask a couple more. Um, Thank you a question. Thank you, Ryan, for sharing your strategy of using resident feedback. My question actually relates to the post-COVID world. 
with numbers dropping, fortunately, both in RGV and LA County, how would you describe the balance between the attention that the city needs to keep on dedicating to COVID related issues and the attention to other issues that are starting to reignite throughout the reopening process? That's a great question. I think something that a lot of cities are grappling with right now. Um, in Long Beach, we really kind of called all hands on deck when COVID started. Um, we declared a statewide emergency. We established our emergency operations center, our incident management team, a communications team, um, really to make sure that we were fully staffed and functional and able to um, start standing up, you know, testing sites and other, other PPE and other resources to make sure we were addressing this as best as we could. Um, we, we are using the data to guide our decision making and how we're allocating resources and moving back to more normal functions. Um, and I think we are able to, you know, start standing up those resources and getting those structures back together if things were to spike. Um, luckily in Long Beach, we're seeing that, you know, since that sort of second wave or that spike back in July, we've had pretty stable case numbers so far. And we've continued to increase or at least stabilize our testing capacity. So a lot of the hard work that we did has sort of been done and we are starting to reallocate resources back to their normal functions right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not still thinking about COVID. There's, um, you know, we still have our, our policy calls with all of our city directors. We still have our EOC, our emergency operations center, which is still functional, uh, albeit with limited capacity. So we are ready to act if something does happen again. But at the same time, we're facing so many other issues in the city as well. Um, there's obviously all of the, um, you know, the initiatives going on around racial equity right now. Um, in California, there's a horrible fires happening throughout our state. Um, so we're making sure that we have resources that we can dedicate to those things as well. In addition to keeping the lights on in City Hall and keeping our normal services up and running, all while sort of facing an unprecedented budget shortfall as well. Um, so we've had, to, we've had to dedicate a lot of time to solving that crisis and figuring out how we can uh, keep operating with, you know, a projected $40 million shortfall or something around that. Mm -hmm. so it's definitely been a challenge, but I think our city management team has been flexible with how we're, we're dedicating resources to make sure we're not forgetting about COVID and at least, and definitely not forgetting to communicate about COVID and share data about it. Yeah. I think to your point, a lot of the, um, whatever is happening now is still tied up to the COVID crisis. So, you know, if you have racial equity issues, they're tied up to COVID as well. Budget shortfalls are tied to COVID as well. So it doesn't seem, they're not separate, they're sort of intertwined all these uh, crises that we're experiencing. Um, I'd like to ask you about, I think before, um, just before, sorry, just after our session uh, was recorded, a Labor Day took place. I wanted to know, uh, how did that go in terms of uh, your reopening? Did you guys host any events, virtual events? Uh, how did residents react to, um, to your operations around it? Yeah, so with Labor Day, we actually, we think we did a pretty good job with our messaging around um, things like use of parks and beaches. Um, and we actually, we had a Zen City Insight um, about just kind of like how successful we were in communicating the, the closures and the other recommendations for safety for Labor Day. So um, we did find that with Labor Day, we had a lot more positive sentiment with our actions there and our communications, which was really great compared to the 4th of July, which I think it was still earlier on in the, the COVID crisis. Uh, I think we, we did receive more negative sentiment about why we were closing beaches and uh, why we were you know, taking certain behaviors to make sure that we were mitigating the spread of COVID. Um, interesting. And we touched on this a bit before, but Halloween, we're starting to see a lot of our cities uh, kind of discussing Halloween, what's gonna happen. Um, has there any, has there been any discourse in Long Beach around this already? Yeah, so, so far it's been, it's been pretty minimal, at least on our, our Zen City dashboard. I'm, I'm sure that our city management team has been thinking about the right way to message our safety restrictions with Halloween. I think people will be upset. I think we know that. Um, so I think it's about how we can really communicate why we're doing what we're doing and the safety benefits behind it. But we're already starting to see a lot of negative sentiment and reaction about uh, some of our, our canceled events that have happened because of Halloween already. Um, one of our busy 
business improvement districts and corridors and said that they're canceling their trick or treating their their and also like other things in the future like their Christmas Day parade as well. Um, and people are not super pleased about that. I think it just continues to show that that resident sentiment about all of these closures is very divided. Um, not related to Halloween, but uh, related to COVID, we had um, on that same business corridor, we, we've been putting in a lot of parklets and other sidewalk dining. Um, and there was an incident recently where uh, we had a, a vehicle, I think from a drunk driver, this was about two days ago, actually hit one of those parklets. And luckily it was at around midnight, so nobody was there. But even then we're seeing this really split dialogue about what happened and how we can prevent that. I think most people tend to agree that these parklets are necessary to keep businesses afloat. So we're preventing mm -hmm. closures, but if it comes at the cost of safety, like we have to really evaluate what, when it makes sense to do that. Um, and we had, you know, we were able to see through Zen City and social media that, that our residents were sort of split between blaming the parklets in the city versus blaming the actual driver who was probably at fault. Um, but it goes to show that when we are doing these, these programs that have a direct relation to COVID and are really influencing people's daily lives, like the built environment or their ability to trick or treat, we need to be clear about um, how we're making this, those decisions. And internally, we need to make sure we're doing that based off of what our residents are actually saying. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other, other questions from, uh, from people on the, on the call? Just a reminder, if you want to just type in the word question, we can unmute you. Or if you want to just type your question in, I will read it out. We've got about one more minute left in the Q&A, so. So I'll just, um, I'll ask a last question in case, uh, just some final words from Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see the upcoming months and going into winter? Um, looking in terms of reopening. We we're talking about reopening, but there's also been a lot of rollback. Um, how do you see that game playing out between one step forward, two steps back, or maybe it's the other way around? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I like to be optimistic and think that we could, as a city and our residents, learn from sort of what happened in July and August and understand that, that there's a balance there and that we do open too quickly, that we will likely see negative health effects and see the increase in cases and, and hospitalizations. And I would, I'm hopeful that, that will encourage people to practice more safe behavior. But at the same time, concerns are really piling up and people's real lives are being impacted increasingly as this goes on longer. Uh, we've had more reports of, you know, businesses closing of other negative effects of, of COVID. So I think, I think people, I think our community's desire to reopen is very real um, and it's very warranted. So I think it's going to continue to be that kind of that push and pull. I think uh, we'll be taking a lot of cues from what we hear at the state and national level. I think everyone's got their mind focused on a, a vaccine right now or new new testing procedures, and we're hearing conflicted reports about when that will actually be commercially or, or publicly available. Um, and I think our our timeline for when that is 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 going to keep being pushed back and back. So. I think we're in a good place now. I think we're kind of holding still. Our, our cases aren't rising, our deaths aren't rising, our hospitalizations are going down. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can, if we can kind of keep this this rhythm and this pattern and these these current behaviors, that we'll be in a good place when we are able to actually start implementing a vaccine or some increased uh, testing procedures. Yeah. Um, thank you very much again. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Ryan, again for joining us today and for, um, for Felipe as well for hosting the presentation with us. And we wish everybody else uh, a great rest of your ICMA Unite. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, Asaf. Thank you, Vera.